I think we'll get started. Um, this is uh, uh, aging, and it can, can uh, we do it better longer? We're going to talk, be talking about longevity, the science of aging, what we know about it. Uh, we have uh, three great panelists here. Uh, Arthur Kaplan is the chair of the Division of Medical Ethics at NYU. Uh, Tom Rando is a professor of neurology at Stanford and director of the Glenn Center for the Biology of Aging. And Yoshinori Ono is a former senior vice minister of education, culture, sports, science, and technology in Japan. So he just can talk about just about anything. <laughs> um, so this is a big topic, and I hope we can start just at the, uh, the most basic level with uh, Dr. Rando talking a little bit about what what is aging in the, at the cellular level? Okay, so Jim asked me to cover this topic of what is aging in two minutes. <laughs> and uh, can, I'll, see what, I, I'll see what I can do. Um, I, just thinking about what I would say, I think I want to make two points. And one is that in this uh, forum we'll talk about lifespan and longevity, that is how long we live. And then the other part of the title, we'll talk about how we age. And then those are two very different things. They're clearly related, but they're very different. And let me start by, start by talking about sort of the biology of longevity, so how long we live. Well, one of the things we know in humans is that we have extended lifespan, the average lifespan, over the past, say, 100 years, we've doubled the life expectancy of humans. Now, how have we done that? So we've done that in part primarily by reducing infant mortality. So we're getting a lot more people to adulthood, and then they can get to old age. So that's a big part of it. But now we're starting to increase lifespan by working on the processes that attack people as they age, so the diseases of aging. And really the treatments of those diseases and the treatments of the, the conditions that lead to those diseases are continuing to extend lifespan. So our lifespan is continuing to increase over the decades and over the, the, the century and probably will continue to as long as um, we don't have some kind of um, change in our culture, for example, the um, onset of childhood obesity, which could actually reverse this trend for the first time of increasing lifespan. So we, we're increasing lifespan. A lot of that we don't quite know how, but we know a lot about what determines lifespan in experimental animals. And a lot of what you'll read in the newspaper are genes that when they are changed can double the lifespan of a worm or triple the lifespan of a fly. And the question really is, what do we, how do we take that information and translate that to humans and can we and should we? Um, but can we, in the sense of, are these pathways that are being regulated in these experimental animals actually applicable to mammals and then to humans? And there's some evidence that yes, they are. So there's some evidence that, that lifespan itself can be regulated by what we eat and drugs we may take. Okay, so that's how long we live. Then the other part of this equation is how we age. And that's really about how well we live as, as during our older years. And that's about the processes that occur that are essentially about declining function. Without a doubt, people are aware of that, that as we get older, basically any function you look at will show a gradual decline. And that's a process that actually we study in the lab. What is changing biologically and biochemically in cells and tissues that are responsible for that declining function? Um, we're very interested in particular in how tissues repair themselves. That's one thing we work on. And we know that as we get older, we repair injuries less well, whether it's a skin injury or a bone fracture. And so a lot of our interest is in the biology of this tissue repair. A lot of that is due to stem cell biology and this field of regenerative medicine. And will that, in fact, allow us, if not to live longer, to live better? Will we be able to intervene in medical ways um, that will allow older people to, say, recover from injury or recover from disease or handle disease better than we are now. So that's kind of intervening in the biology and sort of challenging the, the basic um, evolutionary processes that have led us to where we are to try and get us to live, live more healthy and have healthier aging and then to ask this question about how long we live. So I'll stop there just as a, an introduction. Sure, sure. Could, could yeah. you briefly maybe give an example of the regenerative medicine, um, someplace where the research has shown okay, good promise? Okay, so, so, so let me, I'll, this, I'll talk one bit about what we, what we study. So we're interested in how, um, for example, muscle is one of the tissues we study, repairs itself after an injury. And we know that as mice get older and humans get older, that happens less well. And what we've been finding is that we can administer to mice compounds um, that can actually enhance 
the regenerative properties of, of skeletal muscle. And some of these actually can be translated to other tissues. And we've done some experiments that have made the newspaper that in fact compounds in the blood of young animals when administered to old animals can enhance tissue repair and tissue function. And so as we begin to understand what those chemicals are, what those mostly proteins are, we may be able to develop therapeutics that would in a spatially and temporally controlled way be administered to a person who has an injury, let's say a bone fracture, to help that bone heal more quickly and more effectively even an older person when that healing is, is poor. So we can begin to understand the bio, biochemistry and then the cells that are responsible for the repair to enhancing their function. Okay. okay? Um, so in along the lines of how we think about aging, I know Art, you've proposed the idea of, uh, no, you've talked about the idea of aging as a disease. Is that a good way to think about aging? Is that, are there problems with thinking about it that way? Depends how old you are. <laughs> um, <laughs> so let me go at this in two ways. One is sort of the uh, why we age and then whether it would be okay to mount an effort systematically to build on regenerative medicine or other techniques to cure aging. And I'm gonna distinguish between senescence changes that take place in your body just due to time passage, different chemicals breaking down, wear and tear of your joints, that sort of thing, and diseases that you might get at any time, but you're more likely to get probably due to some biological cause when you're old as opposed to when you're young. There's certainly some diseases you're more likely to get when you're young than when you're old, but sadly, the older you get, you face more risk of certain diseases that way. So let me explain what this idea is about what aging is, and let's do a little poll. So why do we age? How many of you think we age because it's punishment for original sin? <laughs> well, surprisingly, a lot of people do. <laughs> um, and in that sense, it is difficult for them who might accept that explanation, what took place in the garden led to mortality, it's hard for them to accept that aging isn't natural and therefore it would be wrong to change it. That is to say you age because God wills you to and intervening with it is not the right thing to do. How many of you think you age so that the old can get out of the way for the new? A lot of people do. Apparently none of you have thought about this at all. But, um, <laughs> you just don't want to age and that's it. So why is less relevant, but um, so if you're aging along, and some people say, well, if we didn't age, then we'd have a, you know, uh, too many old animals or people around. There'd be no room for new things. You couldn't get change. You couldn't get uh, mutation leading to change. Those who are here would suck up all the resources. God, it sounds grim already. And uh, so we must have to have death to allow progress. But of course, outside of a religious sort of position, that can't be the explanation from a biological position which leads to the evolutionary account, which is the one that I've been interested in for many years, which is we age because it's an accident. We age because in evolution, evolution can't look forward. So it rewards reproductive success earlier in life. You get changes selected for if you're able to outbreed and outcompete others of your species who are after the same resources, then if you do that faster when you're younger, even if it causes you to get sick, die, or fall apart when you're older, evolution doesn't look forward. Everybody follow that? So it's sort of a selection to favor advantages when you're young, and then if they cause consequences like senescence when you're old, then you fall apart. Well, if you take that view, and I do, and there are a lot of biological reasons why we might say that really is, at least in the scientific sense, why we age, then aging is not natural. Aging is not something that it would be wrong to interfere with because it's an accident of sort of random processes. So we don't have to hinder ourselves by saying, oh, we're gonna do something unnatural if we try to attack aging. And I think that's where this battle goes at the social level. It's, is it, suddenly it's out there, is it right to devote resources to something that's just a natural process? My answer to that is no. So that leads me to the second part of this, which we can come back to. I don't want to rant on too long about this. But so then you get the questions of, well, if it is something we should intervene with, what sorts of things would we do 
And remember, there's a big spectrum here. At one end is we'll freeze ourselves or our heads and store ourselves cryogenically in a tank in Arizona. And then we'll wake up and there'll be Ted Williams and Walt Disney and a few other people who've done the same thing sometime from now. But that strikes me as a very odd way to live forever, if you will, partly because there's a discontinuity between where you are now and what it would be like to wake up even if Walt and Ted were there to share their experiences with you. You're gonna wake up as a kind of an oddball freak in 300 years. Everybody you know is dead, who didn't freeze themselves. You can't even remember who your great-grandchildren are, much less anybody else. So a point coming from one notion of life extension that doesn't involve regenerative medicine, it involves cryopreservation techniques. If there's a big discontinuity between who we are and where we go, even if we staved off aging or lived a lot longer, it might not be as attractive as you think. The other and last point I'll make, just to get us thinking about the ethics of all this, if you could, let's say, live forever by regenerating things, rebuild parts of your brain, rebuild your joints, rebuild your muscles, uh, constantly uh, take resources, we have this social question that we have to weigh. There are people in the here and now with diseases who aren't gonna live to 20. There are infants who aren't gonna live to six months. What's the just thing to do if I could buy all of uh, the techniques that come out of the Stanford program or other regenerative medicine programs, and they really worked, still it's gonna take resources to do it. How do I justify doing that in the face of the claims of those around the world who say, I, I would like to just you know, basically get to 25. That would be a major achievement. You're gonna try and double your lifespan by regenerative medicine? That's not fair. Okay, I definitely wanna come back to <laughs> the more abstract and to the, to the ethical questions. I want to ask Mr. Ono, it seems like Japan has longevity figured out. <laughs> Five more years on average than, than in the United States. If you don't count Monaco, they're still number one in longevity and have been for, for many years. So what's the secret? <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's no secret at all. First of all, my name is Ono. It's spelled out O-H-N-O. Sounds like Ono, a very <laughs> negative <laughs> name, but... Uh, I'm, I'll never say oh no to this wonderful meeting of Aspen. Having said this, well, Japanese are living very long, longest in the world. This is one of the greatest achievements of the Japanese society. And the average uh, uh, life expectancy for man is uh, 80, and uh, av the average life uh, expectancy for women is 87. Why there is a wide discrepancy of seven years. I don't know why. Maybe Japanese ladies are much stronger than Japanese men. That's where the oh no part comes from. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the oldest man in the world neither, is needless to say Japanese. Uh, the oldest, oldest man is uh, Mr. Momoi, uh, whose age is 111. Uh, he, when he was uh, informed that uh, he was the champion of the long life of the world, he said, oh, it's my great honor. Wonderful. And uh, the longest living, longest oldest uh, lady, Japanese lady, is uh, Mr., uh, Mrs. Okawa. Uh, the age is 115. She likes to eat sashimi. <laughs> so you, if you want to live up to 115, why don't you eat a lot of sashimi? <laughs> well, she likes to, likes to move around by wheeling chair by herself. That's wonderful. Do you know there are how many, how many uh, aged people over 100 are there in Japan? More than 54,000. But again, nine out of 10 uh, women. This shows again how uh, strong the Japanese ladies are. Well, uh, why Japanese are living so long? Yeah, yeah. Is it the may universal I, may I touch upon this point? Yeah. Okay. Uh, first of all, 
first of all, uh, Japanese pay a lot of attention to the sanitary, sanitary aspect of everyday life. Japanese uh, sort of sanitary man. Uh, for example, when we uh, go to visit the shrine and worship the god, before worship the god, we wash our hands, uh, we wash our throat with clean water. This shows how sanitary Japanese people are. In the second place, uh, maybe Japanese pay a lot of attention to the uh, health. Well, so uh, Japanese are very, very, Japanese take uh, uh, periodical health examination. It's a sort of a common sense. Uh, in the third place, I should say food. Japanese food. Well, Japanese food is very healthy. First of all, vegetables. Uh, vegetables uh, contain a lot of potassium that uh, push down the blood pressure, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, uh, we, under the government campaign, the, cap the campaign of the government, we reduced the consumption of salt, for example, by half during the period, period of 1950 through 1980. That's wonderful. Uh, anyway, uh, we are very careful about the food and uh, Japanese food is very uh, beautiful if you take a look at that. And also very delicious. And also, this is a very important point, very good for health, for your health. Uh, balance of nutrition is wonderful with vegetables and uh, fish. And but also rice. And rice. How, how about alcohol? Red wine? Alcohol? No, no. no. Japanese sake, but nowadays Japanese uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. like to take uh, wine and uh, beer, mm -hmm. etc. Not uh, so much, much sake. Mm -hmm. I'm terribly sorry to say this. But, <laughs> Uh, some, some of the Japanese like to have uh, wine because wine is very good. It, it said, we are told that wine is very good for your health. But anyway, uh, the, the government uh, campaign uh, that's called uh, Smart Life, Smart Life, under the name of Smart Life. First one, Smart Walk. Every day you got to walk 10 minutes at least. The second, Smart eat. Additional 70 grams of vegetables you gotta eat. And please eat breakfast every day. Third, smart breath. What is that? Smart breath means no smoking. Smoking is very bad for your health. And uh, if you smoke, you have to lose your beautiful skin. <laughs> You have to lose your good health. So under the campaign of the government called uh, Smart Life, uh, we are doing, uh, you know, a very good uh, job yeah. in, in, in extent. But right, right now, well, it seems to me uh, more important is the how to maintain, how to extend the health life, health life, rather than uh, extending uh, life yeah, expectancy. Yeah. I've heard it referred to health as health is span. very, very important right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Oh, no, thank you. Can we continue a little bit on the, on the diet topic? I know, uh, Dr. Rando, you've, done, you've spoken and in, in including last night on the idea of calorie restriction, um, simply eating less of everything and that being associated with longevity. What do we know about that? So we, we know a lot uh, from experimental animals that if you take experimental animals and you reduce their calorie intake, while they have you know, otherwise balanced uh, intake of nutrients and you know, what, what they need in terms of um, minerals and so forth, they will live longer. So that's been almost a dominant paradigm in the field of aging research, that, that caloric restriction prolongs lifespan and health span. Um, and Mr. Ono, I think, refers to kind of a, a cultural approach to this in maintaining um, lean, healthy bodies. Uh, the one point I did make last night, I'll make again today, is that that's true that re um, restricting calories seems to extend lifespan in a lot of experimental animals. 
Um, but there's a, there's a caveat here, and that is uh, the way we always keep experimental animals is an artificial, certainly evolutionarily, where they can eat all they want, as can we. So that's, from an evolutionary point of view, a very artificial situation. We probably evolved to always be hungry. We're always looking for food. That's how we spent most, and that's how most animals in the wild spend their time, is looking for food. So when we actually calorically restrict, say, mice, we're probably putting them back to a more natural environment in terms of food availability. And in fact, if you look across a lot of strains of mice, if you restrict the calories, some mice will live longer and some mice will live shorter. So I think that the, the point here is that being lean is probably the most important thing. And if you look at long-lived cultures around the world, not just the Japanese, they have, I think, two key features, an absence of obesity and active lifestyle. Mm -hmm. By active lifestyle, I don't mean going to the gym. I don't mean exercising. I mean just daily activity. They don't <coughs> sit in chairs a lot like we do. And so I think there's a, an important component of diet and activity. I won't use the word exercise because people always translate that into you know, jogging or cycling. But I mean just maintaining an active daily life instead of having a sedentary life. So I think caloric restriction and lean body mass is a critical component for both health and lifespan, as is physical activity. And those two are actually quite closely linked. Yeah. yeah. I just was, was going to make a uh, philosopher's comment about caloric restriction. So, and this includes exercising. I was asked once, or somebody was bragging to me once, that they jogged an hour every day. And they thought that would add a couple of years of life to their lifespan. And I said, do you like jogging? And they said, no. <laughs> so the trade-off was, you got three years of jogging time to add three years of lifespan. And that's part of the, the, the problem in thinking about what you need to do. You could restrict your calories severely. I guess it's better when you're young than when you're older, but... But even when you're older. Even yeah, when you're older, too. Yeah. But a severe restriction, yeah. you're always thinking about what's that trade-off really give you. Yeah. No, I, mean, I, I couldn't agree more. There, there is a caloric restriction society that you can join. And you can have, <laughs> you know, you have to maintain a very low caloric intake. Well, that sounds alluring. It's, and, yeah. and, and, uh, <laughs> yeah. Very thin, very cold, and very hungry. So uh, I don't know. That's how you want to live. That may add years to life. Yeah. You get to do it longer, right? Longer, you get to do that. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, value of life is very important uh, for the aged people, as uh, those gentlemen uh, mentioning. Well, uh, for example, uh, in those days in Japan, uh, the retired persons just stuck to the floor of the house like a uh, wet fallen leaf, wet fallen leaf. They didn't move at all. Uh, they were called, uh, you know, called uh, Me Too Tribe. You know, what, what does it, it mean? Me Too Tribe. Well, they stuck to the floor of the house and uh, didn't move out, move at all. But uh, if uh, his wife uh, s s told him, said to him, I'll go shopping, I'll go out for shopping, all of a sudden, uh, Japanese husband uh, shouted loudly, <laughs> me too, I'll go too. <laughs> so, but uh, recently, recently those old men uh, participated in the social activities of the community, and also uh, <clears throat> they worked uh, even after the age of 65. The, those, those people after the age of uh, 65 occupies about, uh, occupy about, seven, no, 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 30% in Japan of the total uh, of the same, uh, the population of the same age. Uh, in, in the United States, maybe a little bit lower, but 30% uh, of the aged person, retired person, are working right now. It, mm -hmm. It's a sort of value of life. Uh, value of life is, of course, uh, to uh, live, live a very everyday life with uh, grandchildren. But uh, right now, uh, the generations, uh, three generations uh, living under the same roof is, you know, decreasing. Yeah. So we are losing a very wonderful uh, value of life mm -hmm. to live with the grandchildren. And speaking of working later in life, what is life at 130, 200, 
look like? If we're getting back into the, into the hypothetical, are you still working? Are you still doing the same job? Are, are God, you, I hope not. Are like, you living with it's like 200 seven years of academic tenure and promotion runs. meetings? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I do think that's a very interesting question. I've heard, and I'm very willing to be corrected, that some of those older women are isolated, find it hard to have people visit and socialize with them. They're there, but they're not enjoying life so much. Some of them, not, not all by any means. I think we've had some life expansion, life uh, span expansion in our own human history. So from the Romans and the Babylonians to us, we certainly live a lot longer. Even our colonial forebears, well, they could live to a, a long lifespan. You can tell that by the Constitutional Convention. A lot of people didn't. So we have to make social adjustments, and we did. We invented childhood. We invented leisure. We invented recreation. I mean, you go to some of these ancient societies, there's nobody involved in uh, recreation, so to speak. You've got to get your food or act as a soldier or do whatever you're going to do. You don't have a lot of time for hobbies and pastimes. So if we're going to see the techniques applied, should they work, that would let us extend lifespan, I think we have to have social engineering that doesn't get us isolated or lonely or cut off. And we have to have efforts made on the, if you will, social environment side to say second careers are acceptable, it's okay to take an interlude and get further education. You know, you, you want to change the cultural ideas about what a good life is mm -hmm. to incorporate those, th those opportunities. Yeah. I would just add that, you know, one of the, the aspects of this tremendous gain in lifespan over the past 150 years um, really almost doubling the life expectancy in this country from the mid 40s to the getting towards the mid 80s all of those extra years That's that's a miraculous achievement. They've all been added on at the end So we did invent these we invented childhood. We invented adolescence. We invented college years that all became our institutional patterns for how we grow up get married have children have careers retire and then what and then we add, now we added 40 years beyond that, and we have no social institutions to deal with that. So we haven't restructured our society to deal, and if we're going to continue to do that, certainly retirement age is gonna have changed. There, there are economic issues, there are social issues, and these are very, very ingrained institutions in our society that haven't dealt with this change in our life course. So again, that's far from biology, but, but as the biology mm -hmm. progresses, society has to keep up, mm -hmm. and it has not. And, and you have to devote resources to it. Absolutely. You can't just, yeah. you know, sort of open the door to life extension and say, well, those single women up in those apartments in the high rises will figure it out. You've got to spend time and effort doing that too. I think the two have to move in tandem. Mm -hmm. and there, are, oh. there are many Asian people in Japan who want to continue their work. Uh, the work itself is uh, quite different from the work they uh, engage in. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, there are sort of uh, center, I call it, uh, may, if I may call it, uh, server labor force center. Uh, if you, if uh, I make a telephone call to the server center, they just uh, dispatch a person, old person, in order to say, uh, pick up the grass or mm. sweeping mm. the garden or something like that. So we are, we are very prepared, uh, pre prepared for those old men who want to continue their work. Silver Center. Silver Center. Um, and some of these discussions of radical life prolongation feel abstract. What are we talking about? What, how, how far away is it from, from being concrete in terms of the, the biology, the science? When, you know, when do we need to... Well, I mean, I, I think the, the, the challenge is this, is that we are continuing to extend lifespan eat with each cohort. So, so at this rate, lifespan is being extended something like um, a, a, a month every couple of years. And that's continuing. So th there's no, I don't see any point at which suddenly it's going to change. Uh, right now, we are in a gradual trajectory that's just continuing. Um, so 
We have plenty of time to deal with this, but we have to do it from an economic point more than a biological point. Very, we have to do something soon, just simply because of the cost of getting old and the cost of dying. So as people probably know, most of the cost of health care for an individual comes in their final year or two of life. Mm -hmm. And I, I can just jump in here because, and this is going to be grim news for you all, so buck up. <laughs> no matter how far you run or how many calories you restrict, if you do get old enough, you will start to get chronic illness. So you stave off things, but you don't eliminate them. Everybody dreams of dying at the card game or in their sleep or, for all I know, at uh, an Aspen lecture. Some of you may be <laughs> Hopefully not. thinking about that now. <laughs> but um, nonetheless, um, you, you find yourself realizing, if you come out of the healthcare side of ethics as I do, that even when you're living longer, you're pushing back the cost, but you're not getting rid of the cost. There's still gonna be a certain percentage of people who get Alzheimer's, there's still gonna be a certain percentage of people who get a stroke, they do it later, but there they are. And if there are more of them getting there, you're starting to really face a crunch on resources. I mean, I've told my medical students, we talk about rationing now, but just wait 20 years. When we're right in the middle of the baby boomers in that period, boy, are we gonna be up against it in the US and in other countries as well. Demand on healthcare is right in that group, no matter how healthy they tried to be. Yeah. Some of them are just gonna get disabled and some of them are just gonna get sick. Yeah. And in terms of end of life care, also you hear these numbers, most people do want to die at home. Most people aren't dying at home. They're dying expensive deaths in hospitals. Are we making progress on that front, and how, how, do, we, how, how do we do better there? No, yeah. we're not. No. Okay. <laughs> it's a conversation. Thank you. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're not doing a great job. Yeah. It's, um, uh, let me just focus on America without getting into what other countries do. Americans say they want to go home. You poll them, and they say they want to go home. When they get sick, they beeline it to the hospital and nobody drags them there. And once they're there, getting them out of there to go home is a hassle. Family caregivers don't want to provide intensive care. It's tough to have somebody die at home. Sounds okay from the point of view of the person doing it, not necessarily so good from the point of view of those caring for that person. They get nervous. They don't want to deal with all the things that are going wrong. It can be messy. It can be psychologically tough. So. I do hear people say they'd like to die at home. What mm -hmm. I suspect we're gonna to have to do is expand hospice, expand visiting nurse, visiting home service. If we're gonna make shifts out of intensive care settings, you're gonna to have to do more than just say, the family's there, go home. In Japan, the family may not be there, they moved on. We have a culture where families all over the world or at least all over the country, they're not gonna be sitting there. Most of this falls on women. They have jobs, they can't do what they did 50 years ago in terms of this caregiving. So yes, I think it's better to die when that time comes outside the high tech and the high expense. But I don't think the alternative is go home. There's, there's gotta be midway institutions, more of them. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, well, yeah, if it's, uh Okay, we'll go to, go to questions now from you guys and op open it up to interaction. Um, somebody's gonna be coming around with a mic, so if you can just, uh, just wait long enough to uh, have them. Here we go, right over here. Thank you all, thanks for being here. So this question is for Dr. Rando, and uh, it's kind of personal, so I don't wanna age, and uh, besides eating kale and uh, vitamin C and all the antioxidants and avoiding inflammatory foods and exercise, Meditation, do you know of some miracle new natural food I should be eating? <laughs> so, you know, this, I get these questions a lot. It's like, what, what really should I be doing? Don't, it, don't answer this, it got <laughs> Dr. Oz in big trouble. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, it's true. So, you know, I, I think the challenge is exactly what you say, is, is there's a wealth of information out there and a wealth of, wealth of advertisement on anti-aging drugs and foods and creams and anything you can think of. If, if there were a miracle, you would have heard about it, right? And that, so so what, we, what they're all kind of focused on is 
as we begin to understand what is changing in our cells and in our tissues, can that be staved off in any way? And, and you bring up the, the concept of inflammation, and that certainly is tied to what we know happens in organisms as they age. There's more of this kind of inflammatory milieu, and can that be suppressed? So, so the, the challenge is, is really, and this gets back to something that Art referred to, is you're fighting against a, a, a systems failure that's built into our bodies evolutionarily. We, were, we evolved to reach reproductive maturity and then to reproduce. What's happened after that, and this is what we study in, in true in the laboratory animals, in farm animals, none of these animals were supposed to age, to, and we weren't supposed to age to the ages we do now. So what's happening is our biological systems start to fail, and we can sort of do patchwork, but there's an inevitability about it that is a continual game of you can push back, but you'll always be losing. So it sounds very, I know that's not what you're, you were hoping to hear. Um, <laughs> and then the regenerative part of it is that can you repair something that, that, that's broken? But the idea of sort of changing the whole metabolic state of an individual to have them live longer by taking a drug or applying creams or changing diet, you know, that's, that's, uh, there's a lot of hope there, but there's very little science behind that. So, so, <laughs> you know, so, so I mean, you know, there, there are people who will take, and I'm sure people here have discussed, have read about these drugs, but, you know, resveratrol was a, going to be a miracle drug, and metformin was going to be a miracle drug, and rapamycin, which is actually, you know, used in treatment of patients with some cancers, is a kind of miracle drug in animals. It extends lifespan. So all of these, in combination, are doing something that are actually extending this period of, of health and life but the end is still the same. The end is still this gradual decline. So can we push back that window of time where we can be healthier longer? It may be true, but it will all it will be extending that period of time, and then the, the final years will probably be very similar. So I wish there were a miracle drug, but I, I can't provide one today. So. Go right here. Uh, again, She's coming around with the mic. Just for the recording, even though we can hear you fine. Again, my thanks to all of you for uh, such an interesting conversation today. My question is directed to uh, Mr. Ono, and I'm curious as to what it is in Japan that is um, allowing the women to live, outlive the men by, by such a, a large number of years. But I could get it. Well, yeah, wondering about the discrepancy between men and women in Japan, which is exists in, in all cultures, but particularly uh, <laughs> large in Japan. I think it's Well, you know, uh, the biggest discrepancy between, uh, of the life expectancy uh, between men and women is Russia. 30, 30 years. Russia. 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 Uh, Russia. 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 Biggest, Russia. Biggest that, gap. That's where the biggest gap is. Well, well, maybe, maybe I, I don't know why, but uh, it may be that uh, the Japanese way of life has been uh, influenced by the American way of life. Uh, that's, the, that's the reason why Japanese women are getting stronger and stronger. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll keep my mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, some expert, some expert is saying that's due to the difference of smoking rate. Uh, smoking rate, for example, in Iceland, there's very small discrepancy of the life expectancy between male and female. Uh, smoking rate in uh, Iceland, men 16%, women 16%, the same. So the life expectancy difference is very small. Russia, Smoking rate of men, 63%. For women, 9.7%. There is a light gap uh, of the expectancy, huh. almost 13, 12, 13. In Japan, men smokes. 39% uh, of the men smoke, and only 12 of uh, women smoke. That's the reason why the expert says why the reason the why uh, the reason why the, there is a big difference 
of the life expectancy between man and woman uh, due to the smoking rate. This is not what I'm saying. This is what the expert is saying. And, and Dr. Rando, do we know anything about the X chromosome or anything on a biological level that would innately, apart from cultural factors, make women? So, so I was going to make that point. So, so Mr. Ono has referred to a lot of the social and cultural aspects of longevity among the Japanese, but there surely is a genetic component. That is, people who are long-lived, who leave their cultures, are still long-lived when they go to other cultures and they adopt different habits and different uh, diets. So there's a very important um, component of habits and diets, but there's a very important genetic component. And so the, the other point I'll make is that even in experimental animals, there are differences in lifespan between the genders. So there's something, and, it, and it's not always that the females live longer than the males. And there's some interventions, some say, Extent, life extension studies in which drugs are given in which only males benefit and no females, or only females benefit and no males. So there's some, there's some genet there are genetic differences among the populations and then clearly between men and women. And so while there may be cultural and social aspects and smoking may be a part of it, there's probably also a biological part and we don't understand what that is. But the uh, funny thing in Japan is, uh, you know, uh, men, uh, the average age of men uh, as I mentioned before, uh, 80, uh, for women, uh, 18, 87. But health life, health life for men, uh, 70, almost 71, and uh, for women, 74, 74. In other words, uh, men's uh, health life occupies about 89% uh, of the average life expectancy but in case of women, only 86%. So as far as the health life mm -hmm. is concerned, man is now a winner. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I would just, the other point I wanted to add is that the statistic that Mr. Ono quoted about Russia, the discrepancy between men and women, that's because the men are dying very young. That, and, and that's because of habits. That has to do a lot with, with alcohol. And, and so uh, it's not, again, a genetic factor in that culture. You mean that the Russian man drink uh, drinks uh, vodka too much? Yeah, that, 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 that seems to be a quite a good consensus that that is a major component of early death in males and young. Okay. Do we go right here in the front row in the corner? Howdy, Rich White. Uh, Arthur, what you. Uh, said reminded me of what Red Fox said on his deathbed. If I'd known, <laughs> oh, what, how did it go? Uh, if I'd known I was going to lose I fucking drank wouldn't. because otherwise <laughs> I'd feel pretty stupid <laughs> lying here dying of nothing. <laughs> uh, I have a Petri dish of one, which of course is myself. Uh, I used to race USCF and uh, got Epstein's bar uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. And that was 30 years ago. Uh, in January, I, you know, I went to doctors all over, and of course there's uh, no real uh, solution to it that uh, I was privy to. But in January, I started drinking uh, a gallon and a half of water to two gallons a day, and I eliminated, uh, for practical purposes, sugar. And uh, it made some other changes, but those were two of the most significant. Um, Epstein bar went away. Um, I mean, chronic fatigue. Uh, I, you know, I feel tremendous com com compared to the way I felt before. I closed my company, recent to that, uh, and uh, went through. There we a, are. There's the reason. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I went through a, a period, probably, but I went through a period of uh, depression and anxiety. That, uh, they wanted to put me on uh, lithium, and. This three-month regimen of water and uh, uh, lack of sugar seems to, in, in my world, uh, have changed my life. Uh, can you speak to that? So I hear people tell me all the time about the diet they go on that really gets rid of their chronic pain or the psychological uh, phenomena that they suffer from. We see it sometimes in people with PTSD. You hear it all the time from parents dealing with kids with ADD. To me, it's all interesting. There's, however, a part of me that says, 
before you're going to put everyone on the uh, drink a lot diet, and I happen to come from a school where I have a nephrologist, a kidney doctor specialist who says, doesn't matter how much you drink, uh, there's just only so much fluid in your body and you're just in balance, so you just pee out the rest and I don't see any benefits here, you know, drinking more or less. If you're thirsty, drink. You don't have to drink like a fish. Put that down. So, um, <laughs> so to me, it's got to be evidence-based before you start recommending it, before you start putting it on the agenda of what is going to be used for health promotion. You know, we've seen these things again and again that part of me is humble from history. How many of you know the origins of our breakfast cereals when we're talking about eat breakfast? They were health foods promoted by Kellogg and Graham to try and uh, extend better digestion. You were supposed to chew uh, forever before you swallowed their uh, cereals. And this, they swore, really extended life and moreover had the additional benefit of tamping down your sex drive. <laughs> it was sort of uh, mastication over masturbation or something <laughs> like that. But, um, Is that their slogan? Just came, no, it just came to me. I mean, I'm not trying to mark it, but just sort of appeared in my head. But the point being, we don't believe any of that. We don't think these foods have those properties, although there were anecdotes and testimonials and people swore by them. So ethically, if it works for you, I'm all for it. Ethically, if you want to suggest it to others and let them try it, I'm all for it. Making it public policy or health advice, I want to see the studies. So there aren't studies as to the benefits of... Uh... Well, going off sugar is, reducing sugar is certainly good. Drink a lot of water, mm, mixed is what I would say. Can we, uh, third row back there. I was um, curious about a study that I, it was on 60 Minutes and I read about it, about people over 90 that had very long lives and some of the results of that study were contrary to some of the comments. They were saying that when you're over 90, a little extra weight is good, and blood pressure instead of high blood pressure is good. So one question I have is as we research aging, does it change as we get to extreme aging? So, so I, I know a little bit about yeah. that, but so I'll speak to so, so you're absolutely right that, that to, to the surprise of many, including myself, it appeared that people who, who are approaching becoming centenarians that the people who were actually had higher weight tended to do better, and that, and that blood pressure tends to go up, and that, and that less aggressive treatment of blood pressure tend to be better. So we don't know, this is exactly as you say. Much of the medicine that we apply to old people came from how we, how we treat adults, but geriatricians are always saying, we have to adjust our medicine as we begin to learn what the difference is between an 80-year-old and 90-year-old, a centenary and a supercentenary, and it may be quite different. So I think you're, the point you raise is a very important one, that if we have blood pressure parameters that we recommend for men and women in their 40s and 50s, we can't use those same parameters and expect them to be right for people who are 100. Same thing with weight. May, maybe it is that as people are aging to the point of 100, they're losing some body mass, they're losing muscle bulk for sure, it may be that having extra body mass is beneficial in a metabolic way, in a way that is completely different than we see in adults. You know, there was one odd area where a little extra weight helped, and it's odd to think about, but it turned out that surviving our cancer treatments was easier on someone who had a bit more reserve. Right. Right. So it's not that it helps you age more, it's that the remedies we give have nasty side effects that cause you to lose appetite, become noxious. If you had a little more wait at the start, you do a little better through that process. That was one of the ironic findings about having, being a little heavier. But it's not related to aging, it was related to the, tre the interventions. Right. It's an interesting way of thinking about it. The, the mantra among pediatricians I know is that kids are not just Absolutely. little adults, there are different normals for oh, everything, yeah. different <laughs> values. So if you start thinking about a, a geriatric yeah. population yeah. having a different set of You know, geriatricians normals. would say the same thing. I mean, yeah. It's the same mantra. The, same but, mantra. the other problem yeah. is, and this is some take home advice, not about aging, but about side effects. Every once in a while when you're dealing with someone who's 70, 80, 90 years old, you kind of want to stop and say, what drugs are they on? Because this 
But kids are usually not on the polypharmacy that winds up getting given to older people. And every once in a while, your, my geriatrician friends will say, you gotta stop, reevaluate what the interactions are, let's give them a chance to come off some of this stuff to see what they do. So you need a reassessment. There tends to be a piling on in the, old, in the older population of drug interventions, just add things, you don't take out anything. Um, kids don't go through that. They, there are other issues with kids about dose and what they should be on, but the elderly just tend to sort of become these pharmaceutical reservoirs, and yeah. that, that's not good. Yeah, and as people are living longer and longer, that <clears throat> list of medications are on is right, exactly. continue to grow. So, uh, drug holidays maybe, right here. Hi, thank you for the wonderful discussion. I just wanted to make a comment and hear your thoughts as well. Um, we talked a lot about how physical activity as well as calorie restriction can improve aging. And I think we also know a lot about how physical activity can improve healthy aging, like prevent dementia, things of that sort. And I just thought maybe you'd like to make a comment about that as well. Well, I'll go out in the limb and say I don't know if exercise prevents dementia. What it probably does is prevent strokes or small strokes that could lead to dementia. I'm not sure it does much for Alzheimer's or some other things that are dementing like Parkinsonism. It's, those are more biologically based. You can cope with them better. You can be stronger, but I'm not sure they exercise or much that we know about really prevents that. At the same time, it does seem to me the moving around idea, the be active, you know, I think people when they hear about that exercise thing, they think they've got to head for the triathlon or something, and it's kind of, I, I, the studies I see are more in the 10 minutes moving and the 20 minutes of walking mm -hmm. and sort of moderate types of things, but every day and a lot, and not sitting so much as we said. There are about uh, 2.8 million uh, uh, people who are suffering from dementia, and uh, we uh, set up a sort of uh, uh, dementia cafe coffee shop for the, those dementia people, uh, so that uh, they could meet uh, the people We, we, we there. have that at NYU, oh, too. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's called the faculty lounge. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we uh, sort of, uh, we have a sort of uh, dementia supporter, supporter. You know, there are 2.8 million uh, people uh, suffering from uh, dementia. <clears throat> no, already 10,000 people are lost. We don't know where they go. Yeah. So uh, we, we have a sort of a dementia supporter. Do, do you put chips in people if no, you're no, worried no, about wandering? No. 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 Th that's against the wish of God. Because yeah. it's starting to happen here. <laughs> <laughs> no. Mm -hmm. All right, we have uh, time for one more question. Let's go right here. Yeah, yes, yes, sorry. Um, I just uh, want to uh, I hear that a baby girl born in Japan today has a life expectancy of 125 years. What is the life expectancy of a baby girl born in America today? Then also another fact that I have heard too is that breast cancer is almost minimalist in Japan. Um, and yet when, they, when a Japanese woman comes to America, for instance, it, it does not take long for her to become one of the statistics of one in nine. And so are these facts or bubba misers? <laughs> Oh. I haven't heard the 125 years. Nor have yes. I. 115. Or 15, okay. sorry. I, I missed by 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the current prediction for baby girls born in America now is about 100. Mm -hmm. but, that, but that's assuming that there's a, a change in a reversal of the epidemic of child obesity. Because that, that is the, the one aspect of our cultural norm that is changing the life expectancy. So as and that seems to actually be slowing. So that, that's, a, that's sort of good news. And so w with that caveat, given the rate at which life expectancy is, is being extended as we speak, a baby born now um, has a, a baby girl born now has a life expectancy of 100 in this country, all things being equal. Um, but the, um, what was the other part of the question? The, breast cancer. Oh, breast so, cancer, yeah. So there are incidences of cancer 
Uh, Japan has stomach cancer at much higher rates than we see here. Esophageal cancer is big in China. Some of this is smoking. Some of it has to do with genetics, I'm sure. Some of it recently, not just obesity, but there's also air pollution. I'm sort of terrified to see what that rate is going to look like in India or China soon because they've got not only asthma but cancer problems. But diet certainly plays a role. I've seen some of those studies where people move and sort of acquire the Western habit and the breast cancer rate goes up somewhat. But that just tells you that um, you've got to be sensitive to the cultural, the social, as well as the biological. And it's, you know, it's in literally before us. You look at those pictures coming out of polluted cities and you think about the toxic substances there, you know you've got a huge health problem. Uh, you don't have to do a, a sort of biological check. You can see this overwhelming genetic differences to cause problems. But take a look at the uh, district uh, where they uh, grow tea, for example. Uh, in those areas they grow tea, where they grow tea, uh, people live longer. Mm. That means uh, if you drink tea, uh, tea means very good. Uh, tea uh, may uh, push down your blood, blood pressure and so forth, so maybe it depends on where you live, uh, it, it's very important, but uh, right now, uh, the difference is very small right now in Japan, where, where wherever you live. I mean, okay. so you might end by saying some of the things that we need to do if we really want to expand our lifespan, we can get regenerative medicine, think about what magic food we should eat, but it would be nice if we could also get good school lunches and a little more recess back. I mean, those are major you know, interventions that are going to add a lot of life years to a lot of people. They don't take uh, sort of high-tech medical intervention, but they're yeah. kind of sitting there in front of us. It's been, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to hear you. Can I just, yeah. with the green tea, um, there's actually a doctor at University of Chicago, Jeff Green, who actually, uh, do you know Jeff, yeah, Jeff Green? Yes, who believes that um, the difference was in, in why it was, and so his studies on green tea catechins, and actually the protocol now at uh, University of Chicago with in situ cancer is, is uh, instead of radiation, is actually high doses of green tea catechins. And their therapy for people post-cancer um, post is actually uh, one where, where green tea capsules are distributed. So for that woman who would like to live longer, <laughs> have three, if, <laughs> Jeff always says, Three, I can prescribe this because I'm not a doctor. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we were involved in the studies. Yeah. Um, but anyway, it's the green tea catechins mm. and so for as a true antioxidant. So you can have one more pill, and Solgar is the one that he recommends. So. <laughs> but keep doing everything else as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you and very much it's for been, that. It's been uh, fascinating to me to see how many of, of the panels and discussions at, at the festival so far have come back to school lunches and education. <laughs> Even this being a health festival. So th thank you. We have to wrap it up here, but thank you so much um, to our, our Doctor, panelists. doctor. Uh, okay. Please let okay, me, one more let me <laughs> say a few words. You know, uh, we okay. have discussed about the aging society, but uh, Japan is, of course, an uh, uh, aging society. But uh, behind the aging society, we have a very serious problem. That's fewer children. So uh, that causes fewer few children. Uh, that yeah. means uh, the population is already decreasing right now, and the economy will deteriorate in the future. And we, we are a country of sh shortage of uh, labor force. And uh, most, most serious problem is the pension. Uh, pension is, Japanese pension system is a sort of gift from the younger generation to the older generations. Back in 1990, uh, five, uh, gen five younger gen five people supported one pensioner. Right now, uh, 2.4 persons support uh, one pensioner. 50 years later, maybe one person have to one person has to support one pensioner. So this is a very serious problem. Mm, okay. But mm -hmm. gets back to so all, how to, all the how economic to, issues too. I'm sorry we have to end it here. No, but, uh, I'm sorry. We'll, we'll hang out if you guys want to talk. Thank you so much. <laughs>